I'm Steve Mould. I'm Helen Arney. And I'm Matt Parker. We're here with a new series of A Podcast of Unnecessary Detail, the self-deprecating title that is still surprisingly accurate. This time around, we're starting each episode with a different phrase, and today it's flush and forget. Yep, so I've checked out the details of London's sewer system. I'll be talking about the weird siphon inside your toilet. And I'll be teaching everyone how to flush the loo. That does actually sound unnecessary. I'm in the right place. (laughs) Let's get details. I wanted to talk about how scary it is the first time a Brit uses an American toilet. (laughs) Are you talking about the generous gaps on either side, above and below public bathroom doors in the US? I'm actually not, though I am aware of that in a public toilet. If you close the door on a public toilet... Close is a very generous definition. It blocks out a small band around your midriff. Yeah. Um, But (laughs) no, it's not. Like, when you flush a toilet, what's one of the worst things that can happen when you flush a toilet? It doesn't flush. Oh, no, or it floods. Or it floods. It it ejects it back out at you. (laughs) Right? And I've had this, like, with a block toilet, you pull the flush... And the toilet bowl just fills up and fills up. I think, oh, God, no, don't reach the top. But in America, that's actually what happens. You flush the <laughs> toilet and it's frightening the so first bad. time. The, the, the level of water in the toilet bowl just rises and rises. It never reaches the top. It gets to a certain point and then suddenly all drains out which is totally different to how a UK toilet works. In a UK toilet, the the level of water stays roughly the same. The reason it's different in America is because it's actually quite a clever mechanism. It's called a bell siphon or a greedy cup siphon or a a Pythagorean siphon. So, I mean, you know how a siphon works. Like if you've got a glass of water and a a bendy tube, you can put one end in the water and you bend the other end so it's dangling outside the glass and so long as the opening of the tube is lower than the surface level of the water well actually nothing happens you have to prime the siphon first so you get the opening of the pipe on the outside of the glass lower than the water level you get down there and you suck on the pipe until the water starts flowing but once the water's flowing you can then leave it alone and it will continue to flow on its own until the glass empties and that's a siphon you don't have to suck on the pipe. You can just yeah. start by submerging all of the pipe. Oh, yeah. Seal off the ends, then get it in position. Siphoning has saved me on more than one occasion in my life. All oh, right. yeah. And then, then you release the far end and you're in business. Then it's just, it's go time. It's go time. Physics takes over. Uh, on the subject of toilets, in, in the UK, the flush mechanism in the cistern is also a siphon. And it's not in America, interestingly. So there's a siphon in the cistern, and so the water level rises and rises, and it cuts off before it reaches that curve in the cistern. And then when you pull the handle, what you're doing is you're moving a valve, you're pushing a valve up through the cistern, and that just kicks a bit of water over the top of the siphon, priming it. And because it's a one-way valve, water can then flow through the siphon until the cistern's empty. So, Steve, what you're saying is the US toilet has a siphon in the bowl and a UK toilet has the siphon in the in the cistern. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, and by the way, if anyone listening is unfamiliar with either of these toilet designs or just unfamiliar with toilets in general, we can <laughs> leave we can leave it we can leave all the details in the show notes. Well we'll put diagrams and stuff in there. Now as someone who is familiar with the concept of the toilet <laughs> but was new to UK toilets. Like in Australia, it's the same as in the States, where the cistern, you're just opening a plug at the bottom, basically, yeah. to let to let yeah. the water out. Which means, like in the US, you've just got like a button you push to flush. Mm-hmm. Whereas the first time I came to the UK, it's like priming an old-timey car. right? So, <laughs> which is why you don't have a button. You've got this massive handle to like... <laughs> It's like starting a lawnmower. You're like, rub, 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 rub. nah, didn't, didn't take, right? And then you've got to reprime it and then give it another. And eventually, you get the sufficient momentum in the siphon system yeah. that after you have passed the strength test, it will flush. <laughs> it's part crank, part handle. Yeah, that, yeah. That's, that's how we like it. I've installed yeah. a ripcord on mine 
<laughs> there we go. But then you don't need to do arm day at the gym. It's great. No. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, you know, I'm sort of teaching my kids to use the toilet properly, you know, that you can flush it for yourself if you want. And they go, well, actually, I can't. I've tried. So we have to do it together, you know. <laughs> we haven't um, got the body oh, no, But yet. now now the kids, the kids together can do it uh, without me. So, that, you know, both, <laughs> both with the hand on them. But is there an advantage other than the workout and yes. stopping, stopping children from being able to flush? <laughs> there is. So with the plug system in America inside the cistern, you know, if that gets clogged up with anything, then you're going to have a slow leak into the toilet bowl and whatever mechanism, you know, the, the, the ball cock will keep replenishing the water. And so you'll lose a lot of water. It's very inefficient if there's any kind that's of issue point. with the plug, whereas that's never going to happen with uh, a siphon. You're not going to waste water with a siphon. And what's the advantage to, in the US having the siphon bowl as opposed to just... You know, the, the, the water U-band lock. It's to scare Brits. It's to scare the Brits. Yeah. I actually don't know. I should know that. I should have researched that. It's like a bully, like, punching but not quite hitting you, going, why are you flinching? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. What makes the siphon in an American toilet bowl different is that it's self-priming, right? The bell siphon is a self-priming siphon. So imagine your glass of water. Instead of having your bendy tube come outside the glass and down you actually push it down into the water all the way to the bottom you cut a hole for the tube you push the tube through and then you seal it all off right and crucially that curve at the top of the tube needs to be below the rim of the glass so now you can fill up the glass with water and it won't siphon it'll fill up and fill up and the water level inside the tube will rise at the same rate. But when you reach the top of that bend in the tube, then that bend in the tube will fill with water and you've just primed the siphon. So the, the open end of the tube is at the bottom of the cup and or toilet bowl. Yes, free to move around. And then it goes up and yeah. then comes back down again and yeah. goes at the bottom. Yes. So as you're filling the bowl or the cup, because there's no airlock, the air can come out the bottom. You're also filling the tube until yes. it hits the turn at the top. And then it, the water's like, oh, I can just drain out here. But it just yes. draws more and more water with it. You're, you're self-siphoning. Yes. I mean, you've anthropomorphized the water, which is weird. But if that helps people, yeah, cool. <laughs> of all the parts in that setup to anthropomorphize, I think the water is the least disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Other uses for a greedy cup siphon. Well, there's the supposed original use, which was uh, apparently Pythagoras built these goblets with a greedy cup siphon in them. The idea was if someone poured themselves too much wine, it would all just drain out onto their tunic. Um, another place it's used is people are familiar with urinals you'll know that they flush themselves periodically. That's because the cistern for a urinal is a greedy cup siphon. It's just a trickle of water going into the cistern. So it's very, very slow. But when it reaches the top, it all siphons out. So if you've ever seen a urinal flush, it's because a siphon has just been activated, which is nice. The sock slit extractor is this beautiful piece of glassware, uh, like uh, laboratory glassware. If you want to repeatedly soak and drain something, like say you want to extract a chemical using a solvent, then you can use a Soxlet extractor. You drip the solvent in, and then it all drains out, then it fills up, it all drains out, and you can repeat that process. Mm. Another example is washing machines. The softener drawer in your washing machine, you might notice that there's a little mark that says max. You mustn't go above that. That's not telling you... Don't use too much softener. It's telling you, if you put softener above this line, it's actually all just going to suddenly disappear because there's a <laughs> greedy cup siphon in there. When the washing machine wants your softener, it just adds a bit of water until the siphon is activated. Oh, you can anthropomorphize the washing machine. <laughs> yeah, of course you can. It's got a chip in it. Um, final thing to say about greedy cup siphons is... Because you can use a greedy cup siphon almost like an AND gate. Like imagine you have two like globs of water 
And you need to put both of them in the greedy cup siphon before the siphon will activate. It's like an AND gate, <laughs> right? The siphon will only activate if you put both inputs in. If you only put one input in, the siphon won't activate and you won't get an output. It's like an AND gate. But and Steve, what <laughs> use can there possibly be? For an for, AND gate? For an AND, something that only works if you have one AND the other. Well, if you also have an exclusive OR gate which uh, you can do with a kind of slow leak scenario. I won't go into the details, but if you chain enough of them together, you can get a binary adder. So You can get a computer out of siphons. Yeah, yeah so I made a, a, I made a water computer using greedy cup <laughs> siphons. Surely you mean a water computer? We're talking about toilets. Computer. Come on. Okay. You know, they say water hasn't got memory, but... Now, while it is true water doesn't have memory, for the record can make memory out of water. Come on. Uh, Steve, I've uh, got a leading question for you. Uh, is there something that you can point us, you know, visual learners towards to see this uh, water siphoning computer in action? Hmm? Well, it's funny you should ask. Thanks. You know, I built this water computer. We've got all the diagrams. <laughs> I did build a water computer, not just for fun. It was to make a video so you can go and watch the video. Please do, because the process of making it was a royal pain in the arse. So I'd like to get some views. Thanks very much. <laughs> you make it look so easy. <laughs> yeah, that's in the edit. You didn't see the, the three versions that didn't work. Anyway, that's, uh, that's my bit petered out. So Helen, what's your flush and forget? Mine is more of a flush and don't forget. Well, it's sort of a more like a don't forget before you flush, right? So I need to set the scene for this. This is a song that I was asked to write by a water company for their campaign. And you know what Festival of the Spoken Nerd and a podcast of Unnecessary Detail, we're all about changing hearts and minds through the medium of detail. So I have written what I can only call a protest song about saving water. And I kind of want to set the scene of how I performed it. Uh, I performed it standing... Uh, knee deep in an endangered chalk stream in the British Chiltern Hills. I was wearing waders. Wow. I was holding a ukulele. There were about 50 people there. There was a wine truck serving drinks. <laughs> Lockdown was a weird time in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was Sandy Toxvig and some remote control ducks. And uh, I sang <laughs> this song to try and help people in their quest to improve our environment and to save water. I'm going to play you the recording from that exact performance of me standing in a stream in front of 50 people with a ukulele. Uh, here it is. The tap goes off when I brush my teeth. My children's bath is one inch deep. The dishwasher stays off till it's overflowing. The ideal shower time's just four minutes. Well, my shower's four seconds is the limit. <laughs> is that really true, Helen, you're thinking? Well, with social distancing, there's no way of knowing. <laughs> I'm obsessed with eco schemes because life is better with live streams. There's just one thing to spoil it and it happens every time I use the toilet. Fact break. Every single day, the average person flushes 50 litres of drinking water down the toilet. For an average person, that's 30% of your daily water consumption. For me, it's 99%. <laughs> so if I can't cut down on the water that's flushed, my eco status will be totally crushed. But here's the good news. On every modern bathroom loo, there's not one button, there are two. A short flush for a golden stream, a long flush for... How can I put this? Uh, when there's more to clean, but which to choose? There are no clues. That's when I realize. Oh my God, I don't know how to flush a toilet. This decision is taking so long. I've been standing by this toilet for a couple of weeks and I know I'll still get it wrong. I'm praying right now to all that's holy Just label one button with a poop emoji Oh my god, I don't know how to flush a toilet at all So please, if you're in charge of toilet design Be a friend of the earth and send us a sign 
If you can't fix this complication, I'm gonna get a serious urinary tract infection. Cause I won't go if I don't know this dual flush turned my brain into mush. No, I won't go if I don't know how to flush a toilet at all. If you want to see the whole video of that song and to find out the reason that everyone was cheering so much at the end, uh, you can find it on my YouTube channel. And if you can guess the point where I fell in, uh, please tweet me and I'll tell you if you got it right. Um, because I'll be honest, that's why they were cheering so much. It was because I fell in, I saved the ukulele, I stood up and carried on with the song. Um, what a professional. Yeah, 100% <laughs> professional. And <Mid> <laughs> <stream>. <laughs> I didn't. I rescued the ukulele. My first... <laughs> instinct was to hold the ukulele above my head i came out of the water and 30 seconds later i spilt an entire glass of red wine on it so it was a bit of a <laughs> it was a bit of a waste of time really but we got there um, I, I just think it gets to the heart of the issue that anxiety you feel like oh my god i don't know how to flush a toilet this is ridiculous this is so true. You know? I felt so strongly about writing this song. This might be a particularly British phenomenon because as we've discussed, Steve, yep. uh, American toilets are different and toilets in other parts of the world are different. But in Britain and especially in Australia, uh, there is this phenomenon called the dual flush where you, you yeah. get one button for a small flush and one button for hang a on, flush. Hang on, hang on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't mm -hmm. drag good, solid Aussie toilets into your unable to decipher the button chaos over here in the UK, I refuse to let you slander our user-friendly button setup in Australia. You are 100% right. Australians I've spoken to do not understand this problem because the dual flush toilet was developed in Australia. If you want to ask someone to develop a water-saving device, make sure that person's Australian is what I'm saying, right? Because mm. they know how to deal with limited resource management. Actually, can I just interrupt to do a very quick survey as part of the ongoing adventures of me not entirely sure what's weird about Australia and what applies to the rest of the world. Because if you ask an Australian, how would you save water with your toilet? There's one very obvious answer that springs to mind and it's near universal for a misusing of that word to apply it solely to Australia. I think and I know. I think I know. Is it to put a brick in the system? Oh, no, I was going to say, uh, if it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown flush it down which i which i heard on an australian soap opera years ago no, in australia if you said how should you save water with a toilet the answer was put a brick in the system because it would just take up that volume yeah. so you, when it refills you'd refill it with less water and then use less water and so there was an era you know last millennium in Australia, where everyone had a brick in their toilet system. There is a very really similar thing in the UK, um, except we use hippos. Uh, so... <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you're messing with me. <laughs> I never know. No, you, this is true, because um, water companies in the UK are also very invested in saving water, right? Because the 50 gallons of drinking water that goes down your toilet every day, it comes out of our local environment. Uh, it doesn't get shipped in mm. from somewhere else. You can't buy it from some other country. It, it comes from around us. So if we're taking too much water out of the environment, that is a problem. And the water companies are also like, guys, we're going to run out of water. So It's uh, a rare industry yeah. where they want you to use less of their product. They do. It's yeah. so bizarre. And they want me to write songs about it. Uh, you could ask your water company for what was called a hippo, which was basically a, a small inflatable bag that you would put in your system. Yeah. No, we use those to put wine in, and then we put a brick. <laughs> you have a wine hippo? That sounds amazing. We have uh, a wine hippo, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you could you could ask your water company and they will send you, in fact, the water company that I wrote this song for, Affinity Water, if they are your water company, you just need to go on their website and they will send you a water saving pack uh, and you can get like aerator filters for your taps and you can get things to put in your uh, toilet system. But the thing is the dual flush toilet should delete the need for a brick in your toilet yeah. it, because that's yes. for the old style systems that would just do the same amount of water every single flush so you want to reduce the overall amount of water but if you put a brick you didn't move the brick depending on what you were yeah. doing that's not like a slang for <laughs> oh this is a real bricks out situation better better pop the brick before i flush 
<laughs> You'd bring all the flushes down a notch. Yeah, but yeah. if you've got a decent dual flush toilet, you don't want to reduce the small flush very much because the small flush oh, should be quite point. small yeah. anyway. So if you put a brick in your dual flush toilet, you might end up having to use the small flush twice a good point. for the same yeah. effect, which mm. is probably going to use more water overall, right? So it's not just me that has a problem with dual flush toilets. Loads of research has been done uh, asking people to identify which button on five different toilet systems is the one that uh, does a half flush. And a quarter of people get it wrong, which is quite a large number of people. That would be me. Yeah. <laughs> that would be you. And yeah. 33% of people don't think that they're using the water saving function on their toilet properly. And I can see why, because I have two toilets in my house. Uh, one of them has like a small button within a big button. Yes. And you literally cannot press them separately. It looks like a dual flush. It doesn't operate like a dual flush. Oh. That is the kind of thing we're dealing with in Britain here. And the other one downstairs is completely ambiguous. And I still haven't worked out which one is which. And I'm too scared to do rigorous testing because I feel like every time I test it, I'm wasting water. So it's genuinely stressful. Steve's got anxiety. I had to write a song to get mm -hmm. out of my system. But Matt, you're sitting there scot-free because Bruce Thompson, an Australian, was one of the people who fully developed the dual flushing God, toilet Tom system. I. They know what they were doing. There doesn't seem to be anyone in Australia who has to think about which button to press because they've been designed with a user in mind. British toilet systems seem to put like other priorities like, does it look pretty ahead of... Yes. Um, does it save water? Which is kind of the point. You want two big old buttons side by side, both equally easy to press. One's got a circle that's half coloured in. One's got a circle that's fully coloured in. Job done. That sounds like a toilet utopia to me. It is. How could you get such a simple challenge wrong? Here's the issue for me that I've come across with the dual flush toilets. Often it's like, here's a small button, here's a big button. Does the big button mean big flush or does the big button mean this is the one you should press most often? Is area volume or is area use frequency? This is the problem. There's no standardization in this. I mean, ISO, the International Standardization Organization, have actually come up with some symbols that can be used to oh. show half flush and full flush, right? I'm going to link them on the show notes in the podcast page, but um, I'm going to hold them up on our Zoom yeah. call right now. Now, I'm holding up what looks like two slightly different cross sections of a Swiss roll where the jam is spreading out beyond the confines of the Swiss roll. Yeah, it looks a bit like a cyclone you need to worry about and a cyclone just to keep an eye on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it does. Steve, any thoughts yeah. on the uh, shape of the ISO symbols? I was wondering how to describe these and then Helen described it perfectly. It is a Swiss roll, but it, except that the larger one has three arms whereas the smaller one has two spiral arms they're like spiral galaxies but one of them is bigger than the other is this flush a milky way or an andromeda oh. well, exactly <laughs> have either of you and that includes our producer Lindsay, ever seen any of these on any form of toilet no no no, no. so iso that didn't take off i posted a picture of the dual flushing toilet system in our house on my twitter feed while i was writing this song and to say that my Twitter feed blew up is an understatement with 50% of people absolutely convinced that one button was the short flush and the other 50% 100% convinced could not be budged that it was the other one. It genuinely blew my mind that it was so badly designed that people couldn't even conceive that they might be getting the wrong answer. People started posting me pictures of toilet flushes they knew of. I think my favorite one was um, like a huge panel with two massive like hand sized buttons. One of them brown, one of them yellow. Uh, <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> okay. I mean, yeah. It sort of got the debate out of the way. But I think there's still some ambiguity in that. The reason I like the brown and yellow is because I don't want to have to think about the size of the flush. That's not just... I'm just going to tell you what I've done and you decide how to handle it. That's a problem for the back end. Yeah, exactly. You want a black box flush. I don't want to know the details. I'll just tell you what, it's, what it is and you deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> I feel so passionately about... Though, if it's both, do I press both? It's difficult. Oh. That's the other option as well. That yeah. is another level of music. There is basically no standardization, despite all the efforts of the International Standardization Organization on dual flush toilets. And it 
it is genuinely, I think, something that is a problem in our battle for water waste. What about button within a button? Because I oh, the first time I saw that, I was like, well, I want a small flush, but the small button is inset within the big button. Yeah. And thankfully, I yeah. always have I always have a pen on me, so I'm like, okay, I can I can kind of. <laughs> Just get the small... It's not easy to just press the it's small one. It's not easy. I feel like you shouldn't have to carry a pen around with you to flush the toilet in an economical way. I agree. Yeah. But that's the problem. Is the small one going to be the big flush because it's harder to do? I mean, surely, joking aside, the idea is that you can't press the small one without pressing the big one. So you either press the outer button on its own or you press both. Yeah, with the upgrade. Yeah, the add-on. Yeah, button. surely pressing both is the bigger flush. The other problem that I don't talk about in the song is that the old siphon system type systems, as Steve talked about, the whole point of those is that if there is a failure somewhere in the system, oh, it's so confusing having the word system and cistern in the same it's sentence. It's very confusing. So if there is a failure in the system and the <sighs> valve is, is dodgy, it doesn't leak as much water as the American style system, right? So... That's what's good about the old uh, flushing toilets. The problem with a lot of dual flush systems is if they are not very well constructed or they have a certain lifespan and you're reaching the end of that lifespan, they might leak without you knowing and they will leak overall more water than you save mm. by having a dual flush system. If you don't maintain oh, wow. your dual flush system and make sure it's working and replace it when it's broken, you'll probably end up wasting more water than if you never had a dual flush system in the first place and you just got one of those old style massive system ones and put one of Matt's bricks in it. This episode is sponsored by Brilliant.org. You know, the best way to learn is by doing. And Brilliant have taken that concept and turned it into an interactive STEM learning platform. I've worked with Brilliant for years and you know, it's really interesting actually to see how the interactivity of the platform has increased. Like I was actually really lucky at school to have been taught maths and science in a really visual interactive way. And it's been great to see Brilliant doing the same thing online. Brilliant has courses on things like geometry, scientific thinking, even things like quantum computing and cryptocurrency. There's an app as well as a desktop site. And honestly, the app is the main way that I use it. Like I play on the app before going to sleep because it's fun. You can start using Brilliant for free today. And if you want to sign up, the first 200 people to go to brilliant.org forward slash A-P-O-U-D will get 20% off a full year of STEM learning. So I bring to us all a work in progress. And while I have not got the final answer of what I'm attempting to do here, I have accumulated enough unnecessary detail along the journey. I feel like I need to offload it now before I carry on any further. And I tracked this back. I first talked about this. I've got the summary running order from Tuesday the 6th of September when we did a show at the New Red Lion, now long gone theatre, in the year 2011. And we did a show. What, what did we call it? Hang on. Have I even got the name? We called it One of Your Five a Day. Oh, dear. It was all health-based. I mean, do you want to be reminded of the material you were doing 10 years ago? I'd yes love and to no. <laughs> Ellen, you were wheeling out an osteopath song. <gasps> I haven't done that for ages. Which is pretty exciting. Uh, Steve did a medical show and tell. <laughs> Helen, you also had bed socks and sex research as one of your sections. <laughs> yeah, I do remember that. Yeah, I remember that very clearly. Is this the one where we um, got someone in the audience to put their hand in a bucket of ice to see if it changed their reactions? And we made the mistake of choosing a Canadian and it made absolutely no <laughs> yeah. difference to them. I remember that. It only made them stronger. Yeah. I yeah. Don't... <laughs> <laughs> it was just, just went horribly wrong for us. Yeah, it was like, mate, I could stand here all day with my arm in a bucket of ice water. <laughs> It's called a bath. We're also a bit ahead of the curve. We did an interactive activity with the audience with a text-based virus to simulate a virus spreading through oh, a crowd yeah. in a very packed comedy club. So there you are. Look at us. That is scarily prescient. I'm really yeah. worried now. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. And I was talking about Basil Jet and Sewers. And I guarantee something I said on stage, I now wish to roll back because I'm no longer convinced it's definitely true. And Ooh. there's this very frequently repeated fact that when Joseph Bazalgette was designing the new sewers for London in the middle of the 1800s, they calculated, like, the rate of generation of poo. The first <laughs> derivative of sewerage, I guess, of, of London. Poo flux. And then... The poo flux, yeah, the flush flux. <laughs> and then, then they worked out for that rate of having to get, you know, this much sewerage out of the city, how big would the pipes have to be? And then, this is the famous bit, they doubled the width of the pipes compared to what they thought they needed, which meant they added four times the capacity to the sewer system. And it means until this very day, I mean, they're building new sewers literally as we speak over 150 years later. We've been using that same old system, despite the fact there's no way in the mid-19th century they could have predicted high-rise living and the population density we have today. And so I, at the time, held this up. Partly, you know, the power of putting in extra capacity and, you know, factoring in unforeseen changes when you're engineering such a permanent bit of infrastructure. And also the wonder of square numbers. You double mm. it, you get four times the capacity. Big fan of scaling. I have not been able to find any evidence for that anywhere. Ugh. I see it repeated. I have not found a single primary source, any indication whatsoever that Basil Jet, when they were designing the sewer, uh, doubled the diameter or in any way changed it. As far as I can tell, they followed the calculations, shonky as they were, they followed them quite Closely, and so I. If you want, I can edit the Wikipedia page, and then you can use that. That would be useful. <laughs> so I, I'm still trying to get to the bottom of this. However, it led me down the rabbit warren of digging through Basil Jet's calculations from the 1850s in terms of how they actually calculated the size of the pipes required and all the various calculations they did, uh, despite mm. seemingly Basil Jet not being a big fan of that. So really, I want to see if you can um, detect a little bit of crankiness in this. There's a fantastic document. Wait, let me get the full title here so I don't don't mess this up. Uh, it is the calculations of Mr. Bazalgette, engineer to the commission, as to the slope, size, velocity of flow, and discharging power of the various intercepting lines of sewer north of the Thames. <laughs> That conjures up images that what I... What a title! Don't want to that's, see again. <laughs> wow, the discharging power. My goodness. That, no, that's it. Um, and this is... It was basically a book where Bazalgett laid out in semi-excruciating but not overly clear detail how they did all their calculations. And it starts with a little footnote. So it's just at the bottom of... Uh, what page am I on here? Oh, like the first page. The first page of calculations in a footprint he's uh, written... When I originally worked out in detail the calculations for the main drainage, according to the ordinary practice of engineers, I regarded it as superfluous to preserve the rough papers on which they were made, <laughs> considering it sufficient to give my results in my report. And so he threw out all his working. He did all the working Ugh. and went, well, no one needs to see that. Clearly, it's sufficient. It's coming from me, Basil Jet. <laughs> No one needs to see my working out. And so he threw them out. Seriously, if anyone who is studying for exams right now, that is not an acceptable course of action. <laughs> Basil Jet would not survive contemporary schooling right now. No. When I was a teacher, I would have been very... If students don't show their working, I got very upset. I mean, if they'd claimed that it was according to the ordinary practice of engineers, then maybe I would have heard them out, but I still would not have been convinced. <laughs> but it turns out... He, well, maybe not a teacher, but someone eventually was like, okay, Basil Jet, that's great. We, you know, you're very clever, but we want to see the working out. We're not going to spend this much money and tear up all of London just on your word. It's almost patronizing, isn't it? Don't worry about the details. It's God, engineer yeah. stuff. Okay. <laughs> so is, yeah. <laughs> Have we ever made a mistake before? 
<laughs> he continues, when I was required to reproduce these calculations, several important and pressing duties claimed my close attention and left me but scanty time to reproduce them in a perfect state. It sounds to me like he messed up the first time round and he's making excuses for the fact that he's not giving his full working out the second time round. He's suddenly like, look, I'm a very busy guy. I've got scanty yeah. time to deal yeah. with your insistence on seeing my working out. Is this one of the first cases of uh, dog ate my homework? Like It's up there. <laughs> yeah. I mentioned this in order to account for some slight inaccuracies. Unavoidable <laughs> under such circumstances. He's bluffing, mate. He is bluffing. 100%. 100%. Bluffing. The dog didn't eat his homework. His assistant did. On more than one occasion, he blames his assistant. Oh, my gosh. So good. The above calculations for their storm overflow were made by my assistant through a misapprehension of my intentions. Uh, Basil Jet. <laughs> What You're the jerk. boss. You still have to get it right. If it's yeah. if your assistant messed up, that's on you. Yeah, yeah. If, if you're going to be tearing up all of London, double check what your assistant's doing. What I love is in one footnote, he blames his assistant again and then says, when the calculations were brought to me to examine, I at once detected the mistake and directed oh, okay. that the correct calculations be given. But they're still in here. So he was grumpy. And he's done all this working out under duress, which <laughs> has made it slightly difficult to reverse engineer. Yes. So I spent a long time going through trying to calculate how Bazalgette calculated the sewers. It does sound phenomenally unlikely that he would do all of that work, he says, cover up that he doesn't have time to do it again so that he doesn't have to show anyone who's working. And yeah. then at some point during that process, he just doubled a number at random. It, it seems phenomenally yeah. unlikely, now you've put it mm. like that, nah. that this story ever occurred. Cranky guy doesn't like being double-checked. The, but there are calculations there that you can see, and there's no reference to doubling at all. It, nah. Within this? Okay. None. No. And yeah. the actual capacity calculations are even more opaque. And I don't want to go too far down there because I'm still trying to work out how on earth he actually calculated the capacity. I suspect... The reason we haven't had to upgrade the sewers in a century and a half is not because of some genius doubling the diameter, quadruples the capacity. I think it's the original calculations they were based on were so shonky, it accidentally <laughs> dramatically rounded up the capacity. And so through sheer Victorian... Uh, overconfident Arrogance. incompetence. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> They they accidentally got it right. It's just amazing. You know, if he was alive today, he'd claim that as well. Like, yep. Yeah, oh, I yeah. Mean, I, I knew about skyscrapers, knew they were coming. Saw them coming. Let's take this back a moment because um, I know that many of our listeners will be entirely au fait with Joseph Bazalgette and the wonders of the London sewerage system. But there may yeah. be a small number of people out there who... <laughs> <laughs> for whom this Word. is not part of their, you know, childhood um, hi That's... historical knowledge, right? Uh, why were they are we not talking... at our show in 2011? <laughs> huh. Let's go back. Why, why was there such a problem? Why did Bazalgette end up making these sewers? Oh, good point. No, okay, right. So there was a thing called the Big Stink, which is basically London was big and it stinked. And the, the issue really was <laughs> London had grown up around a bunch of smaller rivers that all emptied into the Thames, the big river. And as London grew up, not only did those rivers kind of become unofficial, you know, drains to get rainwater off the streets of London, but more drainage was put in. But it was all just designed to shift rain into the Thames, which as they built over the old rivers was just what, you know, the rivers used to do um but then and actually i think you may be um one of the world's experts on this mazani having <laughs> having having done this for uh, i believe radio 4 the bbc yeah, i've made a 12 minute documentary about this for radio 4 so yeah i am a world expert exactly. on it thanks very much uh that the victorians <laughs> discovered how to flush a toilet and that's that was kind of the beginning of the end really i mean yeah that's that's 
quite a lot of it, but it's not the entire story. So we have to go back to the 1830s, right? This was actually before water flushing toilets, but it was a time when the population of London just exploded. And a lot of people dumped the toilet waste from their chamber pot or bucket or whatever just straight into these rainwater drainage systems and yeah they basically created open sewers full of human effluent flowing through the streets oh. and into the river thames uh, and it was 1831 that saw the first outbreak of cholera and 5,000 people died but they didn't immediately connect that this was caused by the open sewers which were contaminating drinking water a across the city yep. so these cholera epidemics they recurred every few years and tens of thousands of people died right and flushing toilets were introduced to the public in 1851 they caught on like uh, like a toilet on fire, right? Because <laughs> basically they made the problem worse. And this is when we hit the boiling hot summer of 1858, that big stink. And this is something that completely changes the game. London became so disgusting that the Houses of Parliament, which is where our government sits, right? That building directly overlooks the Thames. And they actually considered moving the Houses of Parliament that summer because the smell was so rancid they couldn't get any work done. And that is the point that they finally charged the Metropolitan Board of Works who got this, you know, up and coming, bad at paperwork, engineer guy, Joseph Bazalgette, to create these underground sewage networks based on the intersecting waterways that already existed to take sewage north to Abbey Mills oh. and also south to Cross Ness, where admittedly they would just then pump it directly into the Thames, but it would be further down towards the sea and away from central London, so it was kind of better. Uh, and you have to fast forward eight years to 1866, which was the year that saw the last big cholera outbreak in London. And this is the clincher, right? 1866. That was one year after they opened the Crossness pumping station, right? The epicentre of this sewerage system. And this last cholera outbreak happened in an area where Bazalgette sewers hadn't yet been completed, right? That is not coincidence. That is engineering. You've just shown more working out than all of Bazalgette's writing. <laughs> so Bazalgette put these sewers in, magicked up the capacity... And then through the course of trawling through all their calculations, trying to work out what on earth they were doing, I come to you armed with two fun facts, an increasing level of fun. The bulk of the calculations are quite boring. Things like gradients, like over a mile, how many feet does it drop to make sure that everything flows in the right direction, all that jazz. And then I got to like the cross-sectional area calculations. And Steve, this is particularly pertinent for our ongoing circle constant conversation <laughs> uh basil jet you'd be amazed doesn't use tau oh. for those of the people not in the know steve is a big fan of tau twice yeah. pi basil jet does pi. not use pi oh basil jet uses 0 0.7854 as their circle what? constant what which is a quarter of pi he uses pi on four was the standard engineering circle constant so it's an eighth of a turn yeah, an eighth of a turn. That's wild. I named that the Baz. So, <laughs> Team Baz, uh, you pi eighth of a turn. What a circle wow. constant. My ultimate fun fact, the cross-section of the old sewers underneath London are actually egg-shaped. They're like an egg pointy bit down. That's what? the cross-section of the sewers under London. And the reason is super clever. Not mentioned here, because he's, you know, in a bad mood. But the reason they had an upside-down egg cross-section is if you don't have much liquid in your sewer, you want to have, ideally, smaller width pipes to keep the flow rate up. Because if it's mm. too wide, it won't flow, right? You need to have a smaller cross-section area to get higher flow for small volumes. But if you have a lot of flow all of a sudden, you can't have a small pipe because you're going to run out of capacity. So they designed the pipes so when there wasn't much sewerage, it would be at the very bottom where it was narrow. And then as you got more and more sewerage in the system, as it level went up the pipe, the pipe would widen out. So there's lots of capacity at the top and then there's speed at the bottom. 
And so there you are. Egg shaped. That's well, not egg shaped cool. pipes. That is genius. Pointy ellipses. I've never seen pipes like this. I mean, the ones I'm looking at now, this is, uh, I've got the diagrams in front of me for the Piccadilly branch. And they are three foot nine inches high and two foot six inches wide. So their big old pipe is mm-hmm. doing them a disservice. They're brick Tunnel. like laid um, tunnels, basically. We will link in the show notes or we'll tweet this. I've got some of the diagrams from the old gate and the Piccadilly branch in front of me. So people can have a look at those. Is this the moment to send an appeal to our audience to find out if anyone works for oh, yeah. whatever the Metropolitan Board of Works is called nowadays? And can they give us three a sewer tour? That would actually be the come most on. incredible thing that has ever come out of this podcast. Well, you know, what? we are currently upgrading the sewers in London. I say we, Tideway is the new um, system that's going in. Surely someone there, like particularly if they're decommissioning the old ones... Mm. Come on. Someone's got to get us down there. I mean, if it hasn't been taken over by a site-specific theatre company by the end of the year, I will be incredibly surprised. So. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, can we do a show in a disused sewer? That would be incredible. That's where we'll be in another 10 years, yeah. <laughs> doing shows that in disused be... sewers. And you know what? You can calculate the capacity uh, <laughs> for <Yeah>. our audience <laughs> as long as they're all shaped like eggs. Right, that is all for this episode. Thank you so much for listening. We hope it helps you flush, but not forget. It's good to be back in your podcast feed, and this time we're part of the ACAST Creator Network. That's cool, isn't it? If you're still looking for more detail, there is loads in our show notes, like Basil Jet's diagrams, a video of Steve's cipher computer, and a free download of my dual flush song, plus every song you've ever heard on this podcast. So follow the links in the show notes or head to festivalofthespokennerd.com slash podcast. Please do subscribe to us in your favorite podcast app to get more episodes as soon as they come out. And if you haven't already listened to them, our first series is still available wherever you found this one, I guess. You can follow us on Twitter at FOTSN and Festival of the Spoken Nerd on Facebook and Instagram. You can also email us podcast at festivalofthespokennerd.com. Let us know what you think or if you have some unnecessary detail for us. We would love to hear it. Thanks for listening. Bye. 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 Love you. Bye. A podcast of unnecessary detail is made by Festival of the Spoken Nerd. That's Helen Arney, Steve Mould and Matt Parker. Our series producer is Lindsay Fenner, who also produced this episode. Our theme music is by Howard Carter, and we are proud to be part of the Acast Creator Network. Thanks for listening. 